Hey, Aaron here. So I am making my, my long-awaited, long-promised animal consciousness video, okay? Uh, so let's, get, let's jump right into this. Um, philosophy of mind is not just about human minds, right? It also concerns itself with other possible minds, like those of animals. Um, uh, some of the arguments about animal minds go back to Descartes, where he said that animals don't have consciousness because they're not rational. Um, and after he said this, a lot of really horrible things were done to animals. Now, my motivation here is not to give justification to terrible things that have or will be done to animals. Um, I find the meatpacking industry in America to be an abomination, and I in no way support the torture or abuse of animals. I go out of my way to make sure that I only buy grass-fed organic meats and from happy cows and happy chickens, um, and I publicly oppose the conditions and practices of the American slaughterhouse and commercial farming industry. Uh, I have two cats and a dog, and I love them both very much. Love them all very much. <laughs> so when we talk about consciousness and philosophy of mind, what we mean is phenomenal conscious experience, right? That is to say that there is something it is like to be conscious. When we describe consciousness as having a first-person subjective feel, there's a certain what-it's-like feeling. When we look at a, the color red, or we see a piece of art, or hear a piece of music, or stub our toes, this is what I mean when I say phenomenal conscious experience. Now, in contrast to phenomenal conscious experience, we have non-conscious experience, or a lack of consciousness. We can give examples of this in humans. Uh, a common example would be to imagine someone doing the dishes and they're listening to their favorite piece of music on their iPod and they get swept up in the music and they do all the dishes and they don't remember doing the dishes, right? They, they just weren't conscious of doing it. They were too busy paying attention to the music at the time. Um, you can also think of examples of, you know, you're, you're driving somewhere and it's a really boring stretch of road. 15 miles pass and you don't really remember the past 15 minutes or so of your driving. It's just kind of all a blur. You're just like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, I spaced out and here I am. Uh, better examples come from the scientific literature. There are people who have partial vision blindness. Um, that is to say, they can only see with a part of their vision, right? For the, for the sake of example, we'll say one hemisphere of their vision. So imagine somebody who can only see from here up, right? The top half of their vision, the lower 50% of their field of vision, they, they can't see anything. They're blind there. Now, these sort of disorders are generally caused by brain damage or tumors. Um, they have a peculiar effect, though, and that is that they, all they really do is effectively block the person from consciously processing the information in the empty field of vision. But a variety of tests have shown that the person is still processing and aware of the information in the empty field of vision, just not in a conscious way. Let me explain what I mean, right? The test goes like this. You place a ball in the impaired field of vision, and the subject is asked to try and find the ball with their hand despite not being able to consciously see it. Um, so they'll say, you know, I can't see the ball, but I'll, I'll grasp for it. Now without fail, these vision impaired individuals are always able to find the ball as quickly and as accurately as somebody who can consciously see it, right? They have the same exact success rate. Uh, so what I'm getting at here is that consciousness is not necessary for complex animal behavior. Uh, so the question becomes, do animals have phenomenal consciousness? Uh, historically, like I brought up Descartes, uh, there's been many, many arguments about why they don't have consciousness. Uh, some of them rely on animals' lack of language or their inability to understand predicates and subjects. I am not going to address any of these arguments unless you are really, really interested. Some of them are quite technical, all of them are quite boring, and I don't think that any of them are very persuasive. There is, however, one argument that I believe is quite persuasive, um, and this comes from the philosopher Peter Carruthers. Now, the argument will be in the description box. He doesn't actually use this syllogism, but it's a, uh, it's a very good uh, condensing of his argument. Um, I, if I can find the particular paper that I pulled this from, I will post that. I don't think I can, but I could probably find some Carruthers stuff for you guys to read about higher order thought theory. Um, so premise one goes like this. In order to have a conscious experience, you need to be able to have conscious thoughts about your experience. Premise two, in order to have conscious thoughts, you need to be able to have conscious thoughts about your conscious thoughts. By one and two, this is premise three, in order to have a conscious experience, you must be able to have conscious thoughts about your conscious thoughts. Premise four, dogs, pigs, and cows do not have the ability to have conscious thoughts about conscious thoughts. Conclusion, therefore, dogs, pigs, and cows do not have conscious experience. Now, I think premise one is pretty non-controversial, but premise two and four need some unpacking, so let's go ahead and do that here. 
Uh, Carruthers is appealing to a theory of consciousness known as hot theory, or higher order thought theory of consciousness. Hot theory can trace its roots back to John Locke, the British empiricist, not the character from Lost. His uh, theory is quite popular, and there are several versions of it made popular by modern philosophers. Daniel Dennett, uh, his philosophy of mind is, um, he doesn't call it hot theory, but it relies on the same sort of ideas. Um, an idea here, the idea here is that consciousness is made up of first order, first and second order thoughts, um, and third order, and so on. A first order thought would be something like a perception. Let's say you see a flower and your brain processes it. The second order thought would be a thought about your perception of the flower. And then the third order thought would be a conscious thought about what it's like for you to perceive the flower, creating this phenomenal conscious experience. Think of it this way. Uh, you see something and this in itself is a first order non-conscious thought. Much like the half blind people seeing the ball that I mentioned earlier. Um, then you have a thought about seeing the ball. It registers. Now the next part is where it gets important and slightly tricky. Now you have a higher order, a third order thought about your thought about seeing the ball. Uh, this is what Carruthers is claiming is necessary for phenomenal conscious experience. Only this last thought creates a what it's like sensation in the whole experience and makes it a conscious experience. The second order thought has the potential to be conscious, but it's only conscious if it's uh, it's only available, or I'm sorry, it has the potential to be available to conscious thought, but it's only a conscious thought if it's being consciously thought about. Uh, so there's nothing like there's nothing that it's like to see the ball until you have a conscious thought about the conscious thought. Uh, let me say this again: conscious experience is what we're looking for. This is a necessary condition for phenomenal consciousness, and we don't have conscious experience unless we experience a series of higher order thoughts that are available to be consciously thought about. The experience of thinking consciously about these thoughts is an experience of consciousness. Uh, all right, so I hope I'm not being too confusing here. Let's put this in a very, very simple terms. You have the lower order thought, which is the perception, and then you have the higher order thought process, which is the consciousness about the lower order perception. If hopefully that makes it a little clearer. Um, so now that we've got the hard part out of the way, I hope, let's move on to the easier part. Uh, the most common objection I've heard from, from people regarding this argument is, how do we know that animals do not have higher order thoughts? Uh, Alright, so this is not an objection that we actually find in the philosophical literature, but it comes mostly from people who hear the argument, right? Uh, when it was first brought up in my class, we, we talked about this for about an hour, my, my philosophy of my class. So the way to address this is to point out that there have been a wide variety of studies with animals to test if they have theory of mind, um, self-awareness, and things like that, right? And this is to say, theory of mind means that they attribute beliefs and desires to other animals, that they have some sort of understanding of that. Um, and all animals, with the exception of some primates, consistently fail these tests. They fail mirror tests, red dot tests, tests for theory of mind. There really doesn't seem to be any compelling reason to ascribe these mental states to animals, but there's plenty of compelling reasons to ascribe them to humans. Um, this is another thing people often say is, well, how do we know people are conscious? Well, or this, this is not skepticism of the human mind, this is skepticism of the animal mind. So I mean, there, there really isn't, until we have a good reason to think that animals think this way, and we really don't at this point, uh, there's no reason to, as to assume at all that they don't have, or that they do have these higher order thought processes. And everything about the way they do act seems to make it so that we can infer that they, they certainly don't have higher order thought processes. Now another criticism would be that animals at least appear conscious, right? They seem conscious to us. And I completely agree with this, right? My dog, if I say talk in front of my dog, my dog starts jumping around like it wants to go for a walk. Uh, you know, when my, whenever my cat comes in, it always lifts his tail up in a little question mark and makes little squeaking sounds to say hi. Animals certainly do seem to be conscious, you know, from just observing them. Uh, and I completely agree with this. The problem here is that this doesn't really affect the argument in any way. Um, Nobody thinks that insects are conscious, but certainly ants act in a way, you know, ants and spiders and things like that, and flies act in a way that we could, we, we might perceive as being conscious, but nobody really thinks that they are conscious. Um, and what hot theory proposes is that it's not necessary to be conscious in order to function in a way that animals do. Um, even humans are able to complete a variety of tasks and exhibit behaviors non-consciously, and we have plenty of examples of this, as I gave before. So. It's a largely agreed by the biggest detractors of uh, Carruthers' argument that the force of the argument relies entirely on premise two, while even the most stalwart critics will grant premise four. 
the debate here really is, is this a good explanation of consciousness? Is this hot theory convincing? And I, I'm going to argue that it is, right? Hot theory is able to answer the biggest problem in philosophy of mind. That is the, what David Chalmers calls the hard problem of consciousness. That, you know, and that, that question is, why is it that consciousness has this rich subjectivity to it? Why is it there something that it's like to be conscious? Hot theory explains this in terms of higher order thought processes, as I just explained. Uh, hot theory has all the virtues that we look for in a good theory. It's able to explain and make predictions about all the phenomena. It has extension, fecundity, and, fertur and uh, fertility. It's simple. It explains how consciousness works in an intuitive way. And it, it, it seems to correspond very much with how we think of the way we think. It doesn't rely on tricky metaphysics. It doesn't make any appeals to the supernatural at all to explain how consciousness works. So it's, it's, I think it's a very good theory. Uh, when paired with functionalism, we are easily able to explain intentionality or why it is that physical things like our brains have an aboutness towards other physical objects. Uh, I think that's it. That's all I've got for you tonight. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I suspect that there will be a great many questions, so feel free to leave me comments, make videos. I, I want people to talk about this. I'm curious what other people think, right? I think this is a very compelling case. I'm not 100% convinced, but I'm 95% I'm there. So let me know what you think. Thanks for watching.